Okay, well, I think we can get started if someone trickles in a minute later, that's fine. So we're looking at U substitution. And U substitution is an integration technique. Maybe the integration technique. If you look at how often the various methods are used, this is probably the most important. And before I go into this, let's say you know a word about that phrase. Integration is trickier than differentiation. For differentiation, we have rules. So addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, composition, we can deal with any of those. So I could put basically any function on the whiteboard and assuming you remember your calculus one, you could differentiate it. I mean, that's, that's not necessarily true or it's not true at all with integration. I mean, something like this is a function that's easy to write down, but which we cannot integrate and will never be able to integrate by hand. I mean, you could use computer software to approximate the integral. But even though we can integrate the sine, it's the negative cosine. And even though we can integrate one over x, it's the natural logarithm. When we put them together like this, we get a function that we do not know how to integrate. So integration is easy when you have addition. It's easy when you have subtraction. But when you have multiplication or division or composition, which we have here, it turns into a no man's land. And we have a series of sort of specialized techniques that we use to try to deal with integrals. So like rational functions, a polynomial divided by another polynomial, there's an entire method, integration by uh, partial fractions that exists just to try to integrate that class of functions. U substitution is more general than that. You can use U substitution in a bunch of places. And when I write, you, although not everywhere um, by any means, when I write the U substitution formula down, it is not going to seem general or easy. But as so often happens, we'll just need to see an example or two. U substitution can be used in the very specific situation where you are integrating a derivative times a composition. And you remember that a composition has an outside and an inside function. And this derivative is the derivative of the inside function. And U substitution says, well, if you let if you do a substitution, if you let u be a g of x and du be a g prime of x dx, then this integral is the integral of f of u you. So at its heart, 
what you substitution is doing is a, it's a very intuitive idea. It, the idea behind you substitution is that variables are easier to deal with than functions. So you replace a function with a variable. But as I say, this probably needs to be seen to be really understood. Let's say you have 2x times the cosine of x squared. So we're in no man's land. We've got a product. We don't have any one-size-fits-all way of dealing with products. We've got a composition. Again, we don't have a one-size-fits-all method of dealing with composition. But the specific composition we have is kind of special because that function inside the cosine, that x squared, has a derivative of 2x. So we're right in the position that we were in in this whiteboard. We've got an inside function and we're multiplying by the derivative of the inside function. And you substitution, and everything I say in calculus too has exceptions, but for now, let's just understand it this way. U substitution says, well, in this case, if you let U be the inside function, and you let D U be the derivative of the inside function DX, so 2x dx, well then what happens? The cosine of x squared becomes the cosine of u, because x squared is u. And this 2x and this dx combine together and turn into du. And now we have the integral of a cosine. And the integral of a cosine we can take, it's what? Folks. Um, the integral of the sine is the negative cosine. The integral of the cosine is the positive sine. Because the derivative of the um, positive sine is the positive cosine. So we get the sine of u plus c. And as for u, now u is x squared, so we can substitute that back in, and we get that this integral is the sine of x squared plus c. And that's the basics behind U substitution. There are still, there are no variations to look at and complications, but at its heart and nine times out of 10, this is what U substitution is. You've got a composition and a product. You let U be the inside function of the composition and you turn everything to U and to D. And U substitution is probably one of the most common techniques we use in real world situations. I should say at this point that it still is a specialized technique. 
I mean, we needed something pretty specific to use this U substitution. If instead of if instead of two X, we had you know X squared times the cosine of X squared dx, then u substitution, if we attempt it, is going to end in failure. So it might seem at the start that it's going to work out okay as we've got our x squared, and we could turn both of those into u. But then this process grinds to a halt, because we've got that dx, and we have not succeeded in turning the dx into the du. So at this point, try something else. Although honestly, I'm not sure there's anything else you could try. I do not, looking at that integral, know off the top of my head of any way to find it. To use substitution fails, and so in fact does everything else. So, when I say, you know, U substitution is kind of specialized, again, it's because we need to be able to play this matching game in order to do it. We need the derivative of the inside function to be there. So what would something like here's a u substitution where it's not going to fail um there's always a certain amount of trial and error, or at least there can be in calculus. I mean, you can maybe try letting you be one thing and it doesn't work, and then you try letting you be something else and it does work. But based on what I've said so far, based on the example we've done, um, what do I think, or what do you think would be a good value of you to be using here? X cubed plus one. Yeah. X cubed plus one. I heard it, and I heard a student agree with it, and you were both right. We've got composition. We've got one function inside of another function. And we've got the derivative of that u floating around. And if we perform our u substitution, we get, now well, let me not change my notation just yet. We get the square root of u du. And then, I always have to think about this a little, but the square root of u is something we can deal with because it's a power function. In that list of functions we could integrate yesterday, power functions were on the list. We bump the power up by one, and then, 
we divide by the power. Um, I hope it's it's not confusing anybody rather than write one divided by three halves. I rewrote that as two thirds. And I should not forget the constant of integration. U is X cubed plus one. And we have successfully completed the integral. Before we complicate things a little, are there any questions about what we've seen so far? Then, as I say, U substitution is delicate, but there are slight variations on this that we can deal with. Mainly, we can use U substitution. If we are missing a constant or we have the wrong constant. And to illustrate what I mean by this, let's go back and look at an example we've already done. 2x, the cosine of x squared. And let's tweak it a little. Five x the cosine of x squared. So if we try to do our u substitution, it almost works, but it doesn't quite work. But the only problem we're running into is that we have a different constant than the constant we want. That is to say, we have this five here. To do the u substitution, we ought to have a two. To turn this into two, to turn the two x dx into du. And the trick here, it's a cute trick. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers, it's kind of a specialized thing that we do in algebra, but if anyone remembers completing the square to do factoring, you add a number and then you subtract that same number so that you're not changing the polynomial. And that's the same basic trick we're going to use in a situation like this, except instead of addition, we're going to have multiplication. And then instead of subtraction, we'll have division. So what we're going to say is, well, we don't have a two, but if all we want is a two, we can we can put a two in there. All we'll do is we'll also put a one half in there. So now a two is showing up just like we need it to. And the reason this trick works 
And the reason it works only for missing constants is that constants and only constants can be poured out of integrals. So that five we don't have any use for, that one half we don't have any use for, but these are constants. And a constant we can pour outside of the integral. We get five times one half times the integral of two x, the cosine of x squared. dx. And now that we've massaged this integral a little, we can proceed using the same substitution that we used when we first saw this example. U is x squared. We now have this 2x dx that we need. And we can convert everything into u, just like we did when we did this example with the first time. This five halves is just sitting out front. It's not hurting anything. We take the integral, we get the sign, and we get our constant of integration. Silo that off. U is x squared, so the sine of x squared plus c. Um, there's only one, well, I shouldn't say that, you know, everything takes practice, including this, but um, what I was going to say is there's only one kind of oddity about this that will show up at the very end, which is that the distribution doesn't work quite the way it seems like it ought to. But this is because C is a totally arbitrary constant. And if C is a totally arbitrary constant, then five halves times C is a totally arbitrary constant. So I didn't forget to do that distribution. I intentionally chose not to do it. And outside of some very specific situations, like in a differential equations class, we'll always do that. We'll always ignore any constants when we write RC. So instead of five have C, we write C. So that's good. Um, again, I must stress that this only works when you're missing a constant or when you have an incorrect constant. And that's because constants are the only things that we can just pull out of integrals. This very convenient method wouldn't work for anything else. For example, what if we just didn't have anything? We could still try letting u be x squared. 
du would be 2x dx. And there's certainly nothing stopping us from attempting the same trick, but it's not going to work. You no, know, we, if we try to put in the 2x we're missing, and then we try to divide by it, you know, we'll wind up in this fatal situation where we haven't managed to get rid of all of the x's. So we haven't managed to convert entirely into u. And then because x's can't be pulled outside of integrals, the trick we did on the last frame doesn't work. And this method sort of comes crashing to a halt. So this is very important. I mean, one of the most important applications of U substitution is a really minor one, except that it shows up again and again in applied math situations. It's when you want to integrate things that look like that. E raised to a power times x dx. And we can deal with this now. Um, I don't know if it's obvious that this is a U substitution, well, I don't know if it would be obvious if we weren't in the middle of a U substitution lecture, but this is composition. We don't have the parentheses that we usually have when we have composition, but this exponential, is an outside function. And this thing up there is an inside function. So we should let u be what? Negative two x. Exactly correct. The standard substitution is to let u be the inside function. And du is negative 2 dx, and we don't have a negative 2. But this trick that we saw on the previous few frames, we're only off by a constant. We don't have anything we don't want, we're just missing that negative two that we do want. And we've seen this trick where if we're only missing a constant or we're off by a constant, we can multiply that constant in as long as we also divide by it. That's, let me put this in parentheses. And again, this trick then works because constants that you multiply in, you can get rid of at anything you don't want. That one over negative two, that negative one half, we don't have any use for it, but also we can get rid of it because it's just a constant. We can pull it outside of the integral.
and get negative one half times the integral of negative two e to the negative two x. So now this is precisely what we need for this u substitution to work. So the negative two and the dx are going to turn into du. The e to the negative two x is going to turn into e to the u. And then e is its own derivative. So it's also its own antiderivative. And we get time. It's the negative sign, but we get negative one half e to the u plus c. Which sort of running out of space, but all that remains is to then replace the u with the appropriate x term, the negative two x. Any questions so far? So this is the most standard way of doing U substitution when you have a um, composition and you let U be the inside function. But there are kind of a few other sort of standard places where you don't have composition, or at least you don't have anything that really looks like composition, but U substitution can come to the rescue. One of these, this is going to get you know, its own section down the line where we look at more complicated examples, but U substitution shows up fairly often when we're trying to deal with products of um, trade functions. Something like the sine of x times the cosine of x. And the way we have this written, it doesn't look like U substitution because we don't have any composition written on the board. And I mean, secretly, though, we could think of this as composition if we wanted to. We could think of that sign of x as being inside the first power. And that guides us to the solution to this problem. If you let u be the sign of x, then du is the cosine of x dx. And even though you probably don't think of that as a composition, even though you just describe it as a product, the sine times the cosine, U substitution allows us to, to reach our goal here. Um, I think this is so straightforward that students occasionally struggle with this integral. U is a little power function. It's U to the first, and it gets dealt with the way any other power function gets dealt with. That one bumps up to a two, and we divide by our new power. But 
and U is the sine of X. And we wind up with one half the sine of X squared plus C, which you probably know is conventionally written with that power between the trig function and the x. So that's one way that um, U substitution sometimes gets used. And again, we'll see more examples of this. I don't think just for time reasons. I don't know if we'll do more examples today. Um, the other kind of somewhat standard application of U substitution, where you might not think of yourselves as having composition, is certain types of division. In particular, when we have a function down here and the derivative of the function up there. And again, this secretly is composition. It's not actually an exception. It's f prime of x times f of x raised to the negative first dx. And if you rewrite it this way, you see, well, we do have a composition. F of X is inside the negative first power. And we have the derivative of the inside function and U substitution ought to work. Two X over X squared plus one DX. Um, if U substitution is going to work with a fraction, and again, there are there's never any guarantee in the calculus, in integral calculus, hmm. that any particular method is going to work. But if U substitution is going to work. It's by letting U be the denominator of the fraction. And then hopefully the numerator of the fraction will be a DU, which is which is precisely what we do have here. 2x dx is going to turn into du. And we'll get 1 over u du. So this, this integral turns out to be very important that this integral of one over u is the natural logarithm because it lets us finish out this problem and problems like it. The natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one plus c. And this is a trick that's going to be used somewhat frequently throughout this class. I've mentioned that 
when we uh, are trying to integrate rational functions, we'll learn a trick for that, partial fractions. Partial fractions are going to be used in, what's the word I'm looking for? Partial fractions are going to be used alongside this U substitution trick in that chapter. So even if this looks pretty specialized, it's used quite often. And as often happens in calculus too, I mean, we give students these horrible homework problems, but as often happens, the, the actual real world applications of this method tend to be pretty simple. Things like integrating three over two minus x dx. And the only reason I call this pretty simple is, I mean, if you look at these functions, we've just got a constant on top and we've got a nice little linear thing down below. So we can try U substitution when we have a fraction. There is no guarantee it's going to work. But if we're going to try U substitution here, then U is what? Two minus X. Two minus X. And that makes D U will what? One DX is close. Negative one. Yeah. Negative one DX. So we don't have a negative one, we have a three, but having the wrong constant is okay. We've seen this before. If we want a negative one, we'll simply throw it in. And at the same time, we'll divide by it. So that three and this one over negative one, which is negative one, we don't have any use for those, but they're just constants. We can just yank them out. Negative three, the integral of negative one over two minus x dx. And when we use this trick, I mean, we think, okay, we've got the negative one, we've got the dx. If dx were just a number, we would multiply them together. So we think of that as being negative one dx. And our substitution goes through. The integral of one over u is the natural log. This, this absolute value is important. Make sure not to forget it. Uh, in particular, if x is greater than the two, then we need that absolute value in order not to get an error. This last trick has one more very standard application. I mean, probably nine times out of 10, when you use this fast trick, it will be for expressions that look just like that. 
the number over a linear expression. But it will also, and that's I usually, as I say, try to try to keep our Tuesday, Thursday lessons down to 50 minutes. Let's see if we can do this in that time. This trick will allow us to integrate the tangent. And the integral of the tangent is one of those integrals that I never commit to memory. I mean, modern tech, I mean, even, even when I was a student, I mean, back then you would have you know, charts of integrals. And if you needed something like the integral of the tangent, you just look it up in the chart. Now we have cell phones. Um, so I've never committed this integral to memory because it doesn't show up often enough for that to be productive. But it does provide a nice little application of this method because the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine. And this is essentially the situation we were in back here. I mean, the top is basically the derivative of the bottom. I say basically because we are missing a negative, but missing negatives can go in. We saw that in the very last problem, we were missing a negative one. So we just put the negative one in along with another negative one to cancel out. So the integral of, we want a negative in front of the sign. We could think of this as putting in a negative one and then dividing by a negative one. We could also think of this as two negative signs cancel each other out. So we'll put in the negative sign we need, and then we'll put in a neg another negative sign to get rid of it. However, we choose to think of it, this negative sign of x dx is going to turn into du. The cosine of x is u. And we're going to get this. And negative signs, because we can think of a negative sign as having a negative one, and constants pull out of integrals, negative signs can also pull out of integrals. So I'm going to just take that negative one and yank it out. And we get negative the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. The negative natural log of the absolute value of the cosine of x plus c. Not the loveliest integral, sadly, that's something we'll see throughout the course that, well, that integration often lends or leaves you with kind of complicated looking expressions. But that's, well, I was going to say that's it. That's 
No, that is it for this section. It's just that this new substitution is kind of split across two sections. I mean, what remains is pretty quick, but we'll still want to talk about it. Um, I mean, what remains is using this technique when we're trying to integrate a definite integral, something like this. I mean, the trick is I'm not going to finish this problem today. We'll do it tomorrow. I mean, this trick is fundamentally pretty simple. We need an antiderivative. To find an antiderivative, we need an indefinite integral. Well, we know how to find an indefinite integral. We know how to find this. So to find the definite integral, simply first find the indefinite integral. But there are a few quirks to this method, which we will discuss tomorrow, along with um, starting to look at some geometric stuff involving area. And I will see you then, remember, Tomorrow is Wednesday, meaning that we meet at nine o'clock instead of eight. And I will see you then.